call the meeting to order. And before we go forward, I would like to have our interpreter um, uh, let us know how to access the interpretation. So I think today is that uh, Yalka, if you can go ahead and please give us instructions. Good morning. Uh, to use the interpretation feature, please scroll to the bottom of the Zoom screen where the meeting controls are. Click on the interpretation icon, the world, and select English as your language. If you're joining through Zoom mo mobile app from a cell phone, tablet, etc., please press the ellipses, then interpretation, and then choose your language. Finally, click on the mute original audio to not hear the original Spanish flow in the background. Headsets are available for interpretation. If you are in the meeting room, please check out a headset from the receptionist in the lobby. Buenos días. Para hacer uso del servicio de interpretación, favor de desplazarse a la parte inferior de la pantalla de Zoom donde aparecen los controles. Haga clic en el icono de interpretación del globo terráqueo y seleccione español. Si está utilizando una aplicación móvil de Zoom, celular, tableta, etc., presione los puntos suspensivos, luego interpretación y luego el idioma. Si no desea escuchar el audio original en inglés en el fondo, por favor seleccione silenciar audio original. Contamos con auriculares disponibles para el servicio de interpretación. Si se encuentra en la sala de la reunión, por favor pedir auriculares con la recepcionista en el vestíbulo. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Well, let me ask the clerk, Ms. Francesca Webb, to confirm that we have a quorum and to do the roll call. Thank you, Chair. For San Diego County Regional Airport Authority, Rafael Perez. Here. The City of San Diego is absent. For the County of San Diego, Supervisor Anderson. Here. For East County, Chair Shu. Here. And also Councilmember Mendoza. Here. For Metropolitan Transit System, Councilmember Moreno. Present. And Sharon Cooney. Here. Uh, for North County Coastal, Deputy Mayor Zito. Present. I'm sorry, Council Member Zito, we had a title change. Uh, for North, North County Inland is absent. For North County Transit District, Deputy Mayor Edson. Present. The Port of San Diego is absent. For South County, Council Member Duncan. Present. And for Caltrans, Director Dayarda. Yeah. And the Southern California Tribal Chairman's Association is absent. That completes the roll call and we do have a quorum. Thank you, Francesca. Uh, we'll take uh, public comments. So do we have any public commenters on non agendaized items? So Ms. Francesca, can we have, uh, can you go, out, go ahead and, and call out uh, those who may have uh, public comments? And we'll go for two minutes uh, this for public comments. Thank you, Chair. We do have two public speakers. Uh, Blair Beekman, if you'd like to step up to the podium, you'll be first, followed by the original draw on Zoom. Hi, thank you, Blair Beekman. I thought I would come here in person today just to kind of check out how your new security plans are going. Uh, good luck and how uh, you can continue ideas of flexibility and uh, openness in, in deciding. Uh, things seem pretty mellow uh, about how you're handling it. Thank you. Um, as national security issues at the local level in this country need to be considered at this time with current events of Israel, Gaza, and the Middle East, it is thankful and hopeful that local U.S. cities, uh, including San Diego and County, and now into 2024, can, con can also con continue to consider at this time better ideals and good practices that include ideas of reimagine health and human services and good tech accountability. For Sandag, San Diego County, and local U.S. communities to want to continue to work towards open democracy, accountability, and our better human ideals at this time and over the next few months, this can work collectively for this country to continue to work toward the ideas of positive sustainability and peace before war and good ways for the U.S. and its local communities to help stay out of the secrecy, opacity, and duplicity of a wartime of democracy and economy. We are tired of war in this country. I think we want to work towards peace. I hope local cities in the U.S. can continue in 2024 openness and accountability and to continue to work towards ideas of peace before war. I think these good practices and good efforts at the local U.S. level into 2024 can give good examples and best practices to all sides in Israel at this time as well, and that I think will be much needed and much respected. I hope we are at a time all sides can want to work 
uh, more towards negotiation and dialogue instead of war, violence, and harm as how to decide the future of Gaza and the human rights of all people now living in Israel. We have some national security issues to consider at this time in this country. Hopefully we can continue to ask about open, accountable, good tech accountability practices and other good practices into 2024. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be the original draw. You can go ahead when you're ready. Yeah, um, I think we need to start thinking about how we are, you know, sitting here and demonizing driving and making it such a, you know, horrible thing to put people in a state of fear so that they, you know, feel like they got to comply and capitulate with all of the um, agendas that you have in coming down the pipe. And it's kind of sad because the city of San Diego is telling people that they're not taking options as far as driving goes when that's exactly what's happening and drivers are paying for their own demise of driving. It's um, you know, we're paying for the end of it uh, to come. And most people don't know that. And when we're sitting here lying to them and telling them that they're not having any choices taken away, when that in fact is what's happening, you know, we're not being clear with the people. They don't fully understand that you're trying to get them out of their cars. And that even if they do get an electric vehicle, it doesn't matter because you're still going to need to get them out of the car and quit get people to quit driving. Um, and so if we can't be, you know, fully transparent with that and sit here and, and lie to people and what would be the point of doing that if exactly what you're doing is taking away options? Um, you know, it's, it's, it leads people down a, um, you know, path that makes them, you know, continue to believe in people that are actually, you know, taking away options. And um, when we can't be, honest with the people you have to like i said wonder why you you can't just tell them exactly what the plan is that yes we're we're going to make sure that you don't drive anywhere even if you buy an electric vehicle it's not going to matter you're still going to have to get out and walk and bike and use public transit um not sit there and tell them oh no we're not taking your options we're just like giving you more options basically um you know the people need to uh clearly see what's going on because, um, you know, if you can't be honest with them now, they're going to be really pissed off later when they find out what you've been doing and that you've been lying to them. So, um, yeah. That concludes the public comments. Thank you, uh, Francesca. Um, let's see, let's go on to uh, comments from, uh, from staff, from Colleen. So provide uh, the agency update. Great. Good morning, everyone. Um, I wanted to report on a few things that happened at the board of directors meeting last Friday. Um, first of all, the board received a report on various issues that are going on at the State Route 125 Toll Operations Center. And um, our goal to ensure that all customer accounts are managed properly and everyone is charged correctly and our plan to move forward with a new system and the steps involved in that. Many of you may have seen the article earlier this week from our chairwoman really doubling down on that action plan, and we will be bringing forward an action plan to the board of directors at the January 12th meeting. So I wanted to provide that update to you. We also have drafted um, an annual report for the work that Sandag and the board of directors and all of you have accomplished over the last year. And so we're looking forward to having our chairwoman issue that next week. Um, I also wanted to let you know that we are continuing to make progress on the Ote Mesa East port of entry. We had the secretary of transportation, Tokes Misha Khan here last week, and we actually took a tour on the other side of the border. So we all went in this big like military sort of Jeep and it's, truly amazing what our partners in Tijuana have been able to accomplish connecting the roadways. So I, we're making great progress there and I'm really excited to share that. The other thing I wanted to mention is that our Low San Corridor received this important designation as the corridor, a corridor ID program, and this allows us to get priority funding through federal funds. So this is really good news for us as we can continue to work on making that rail corridor better than ever. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention 
is that um, on the on Friday, the board of directors also, I'm so honored, appointed me to serve as the interim CEO starting in January. So I very much look forward to serving in that role and really ensuring that we continue the great work Sandag is doing, really work hard to bring credibility to the agency and just kind of steady the ship as we get ready for the next CEO. Um, and then it's our very last meeting with the amazing Caltrans District 11 Director Gustavo, who has served in, in a super important role leading in this um, region and really statewide. We're going to miss him. And I don't know if we can call on him to maybe share a few words about what's next up for him, but just really going to miss having you here. I know you're leaving District 11 in good hands, but um, really appreciated the, your partnership over the last many years here in the region. Thank you, Colleen. And so we, I should have said congratulations to you to, to being our uh, interim head of SANDAG. So congratulations to you. So Gustavo, um, give us, um, this This may be, well, it will be your last transportation committee meeting attendance, but you're, as you mentioned earlier, you're welcome to come back um, and make public comments. <laughs> thank you, Chair Shu, and thank you, thank you, Colleen. Um, first of all, congratulations, Colleen. I, I've known you for a long time. We've worked together on many, many projects. Uh, so I know that this is an excellent choice by the board and that the agency is in great hands under your leadership. Uh, as for me, after 32 and a half years of state service, it's time to uh, give up the cell phone and uh, and, and uh, sleep at night without uh, fear being awoken. Uh, it's a great time to spend a little more time with family and um, uh, and also give it the opportunity uh, to to others to lead the district. And like you said, uh, there, there we have a great team. I know the district will be in great hands. I will miss uh, coming to these meetings. This is the best committee that Sandak has. So thank you, Chair Shu, for your leadership leading this committee. Uh, maybe I'm biased because I love transportation, uh, but uh, there's a lot of important stuff that comes through this committee, and I appreciate all of you, uh, your comments, uh, when those items come up for discussion. And uh, working together, we can make transportation better for the people of the region. So I, again, uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Gus. Uh, we'll, we'll miss you, but... Um... Uh, good luck with your retirement. And, you know, I was also in state service for not quite as long as you, but you could also consider uh, taking up public uh, service by getting elected somewhere if you want. So keep that in mind. Um, uh, let's, let's go on to um, um, comments or uh, issues, uh, items that the members want to bring up. So member comments, Council Member Mendoza. Um, I'll, I'll keep this short, but this is my last meeting also. Um, after eight years um, as uh, alternate on Sandag, I'm, I'm stepping off, um, and um, George Gastel will be moving up as alternate, and my colleague Allison Snow is coming on as uh, second alternate. Um, and I, so I just want to say I'll, I'll be seeing all my colleagues, and I may be back, you know, but I I wanted to give um, Council Member Snow an opportunity to get involved uh, more at the at at this level, and I think that you'll all really enjoy working with her. Um, but I I'll probably still see you at MTS meetings and um, League of California Cities meetings. But mainly, I just wanted to thank the Sandag staff, um, all of you. It it has it's been eight years, and it's just been. Uh, such a pleasure to work with all of you, and I'll, I'll still be listening and watching. Um, but anyway, th uh, this is just an opportunity for me to thank you for, for everything, and happy holidays. Thank you, Jennifer. I, I know you've been at Sandag for a long time and uh, representing um, East County and uh, City of Lima Grove, so we'll miss you here. But um, you'll still be around, and I'm sure we'll we'll... As a neighboring uh, uh, city, I'll be counting on you from from La Mesa to do uh, things for us in East County. So thank you. Any other 
uh, Vivian Moreno. Councilman. Thank you. Um, I, I have a few questions and I should follow up with staff regarding uh, the tolling on the 125. Um, just to state, I, I was pretty caught off guard um, and it, the news was very shocking uh, to me. And I hate when I read something in the news before we're told by staff. Um, so I will point that out. Um, but I'm just wondering, um, I needed a bigger brief on the 125 um, because it does impact my community. Um, we have the connectors that were just um, built, I think about like four or five years ago with Tina Kasgar, if you guys remember her, I, we loved her. Um, but um, how much more is left in what we, um, what we paid for the 125? Just curious. And you might, I'm, I know I'm asking you on the spot, so I don't expect you to know that. Uh, but like I said, I can get that for you. Yeah, I would love to get um, get a deeper dive on the 125 toll. Um, but thank you for the time. Any other member comments? Uh, I should say that, you know, uh, for SANDAG board members, um, we were at a closed session back in October in which we, we were briefed uh, about the, the issues uh, with the vendor. Uh, so even prior to November, um, uh, our uh, uh, board members were actually given a lot of information with regards to what the issues were and, and what SANDAG um, was uh, uh, going to be doing. Uh, so. Okay, so then I'm going to look at our chair. As a uh, committee member of the Transportation Committee, I right. was shocked to to hear I, the news. I, I, I totally understand. And, yeah. and really, uh, so... <laughs> So what you see in the press is not always, I think, uh, true <laughs> so, with regards to uh, to uh, us being completely blindsided. It was in closed session for, for a reason, um, and that reason is no longer there, so we can't share that. So I, And I can share that information with you later to tell you what this uh, inside story was. Councilman Duncan. I do want to say, though, that I look forward to having our independent auditor review the situation. It... it, it is something that is hard to wrap your mind around completely, you know, because on one hand, we had the lost tolls when the system was down of $1.8 million. We've had, you know, the accounts of consumers that were mischarged. And I am grateful that it looks like most, if not maybe even all by now have been resolved because as of last Friday, it looked like those, those applications have been changed. I know we have our internal accounting issues. Also though, we have the liquidated damage issues against the vendor and we're, we're trying to implement a whole new system of $28 million. And, and I do you know, think it's a very good question to ask, you know, how does that affect, if any, the length of how long consumers will be charged with the tolls? So, I mean, on one hand, yeah, you know, Chair, we did get information that there was a problem, but I feel I'm pretty good at, you know, distilling problems and being able to explain them. And I still have questions and, and concerns. And one thing that wasn't mentioned today, which I am grateful for, I think will be a good uh, decision along with our internal auditor looking at the toll road problem is that I understand Deputy CEO Ray Major was assigned to supervise over this project and mm -hmm. nothing against our CFO, but I think that is a very um, good move. So I look forward to that report and moving forward. But I do agree that I think our, our, our chair and our leadership at the board level is taking it very seriously and working hard with our new interim CEO to make sure that it gets resolved. Okay. So thank you. If we can go ahead with that. And I have to look to our attorney if we're getting too in, like making this an item. But I, I did want to respond that we do know there's, I got this hot little red note here that we owe $167.1 million to pay off the roadway. So that was one. And just to be very clear on the action plan that our board chair laid out was since this is very much a software issue and that is Ray Major's expertise and, expertise and is very much an operational issue, that's why he's been placed to really dive into this. I think it was also reported at the board meeting that we have a consultant, Deloitte, who's continuing to look at this and provide feedback to us on a regular basis. And so we'll be reporting that out to the board as well. And then the third was the action for um, your independent auditor to be doing a, a parallel um, assessment of the situation. And so we have been in touch with 
with her on making sure that, you know, we were in alignment on, on how we're doing this, what the differences are, making sure there's a solid um, place of separation so that it truly is independent. This is really complicated and we're gonna to continue to provide information to all of you as that becomes available. And if any of you need individual briefings and so forth, Council Member Moreno, we're happy to work with your staff to set that up. Okay. Did I go too far, Attorney? And just a final comment. And again, I think this is totally appropriate because we're just giving information and we're not you know, going back and forth with the real discussion. But anyways, my final comment is, I think there's been, um, some misunderstandings that have been in the news, particularly, for instance, in the last Union Tribune article, it talked about the auditor of our financial statements, the CPA that was here, as if that person's going to be doing an independent audit of the toll road situation, which is incorrect. That person is what every organization, profit or nonprofit, you know, potentially goes through with having their their financials audited just to see if they're in compliance with standard accounting practices based off of the information Sandag staff provides. That is not an audit that's going to address any of the real concerns that anyone has. It's our internal independent auditor. So I just wanted to make that clear because I just read that in the Union Tribune in the last couple of days. Thank you. Thank you. And Councilman Duncan, I, I do totally agree with you. This is exactly why we have an independent auditor is to have a, they can do a deep dive and do a real performance audit as well. It's just uh, uh, information about uh, whether the numbers were straight. Um, a performance audit would, would actually go into the processes that were, uh, that took place within Sandag as well. So, uh, and that's, you know, forthcoming. Um, uh, I'm going to kind of sure. make a switch Oh, I'm sorry. Can I, I, make one discussion? I just wanted to uh, correct, since, since I am the chair of the audit committee, <laughs> please <laughs> did think it was worth noting that, yes, um, this is being taken very seriously. And um, Council Member Duncan, just to your point that uh, I want to be uh, some of the terminology, um, it is very important because you do have press involved and in that um, a couple of times the word internal auditors mentioned, we do not have an internal auditor. We have an independent auditor. And that's a very key point. And uh, the good news is that this is being taken seriously. She's updating the audit plan. Um, and uh, we'll be back and saying how what the resources are. Management's been fully supportive of, of uh, you know, the resources necessary, apply, saying they apply resources as, they, as they're needed. And the good thing about running it through the audit committee as well is that you've got three public members there that are financial experts and, you know, experts in auditing areas that are part of our committee as well that will be you know able to take a look at the output and provide uh help and guidance to the board when when the results do come back so um just wanted to make sure people were clear that that's you know this has been the the direction has been received and and to your point it's very complicated to the WDCEO's point is very complicated um and it's going to be difficult to keep this straight in the press but we need to keep our heads down and focused on making sure we're doing the right thing and and that's what we're going to do um and then the uh, Council Member Moreno's point, uh, even I, as the chair of the audit committee, didn't know about this until it came out in the press. So there's clearly some internal processes that could be improved here, um, because if 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 audit had been aware of this in October, we could be way ahead of the game at this point versus jumping in pretty late. So we'll be working on that, too. Thanks. Thank you, Councilman Zito. Any other comments? I have kind of a uh, alteration of the uh, agenda to some degree. So we have public, I mean, a member comments now, but I'm going to ask that we bring it back just before we close. Uh, and I'm going to ask all um, uh, members of the committee to answer uh, two questions that I'm going to post to all of you. Uh, but you have the whole meeting to think about your answer. Uh, so the first question is what went well with the Transportation Committee this last year? And the second question is, what would you like to see the Transportation Committee do next year? But the other caveat is that your answers can only be one, one sentence for each question. So we don't stay here too long. But you have the rest of this meeting to think about your answers, and then we'll come back to this just before we close today. So look back, what went well? What would you like to see next year? And one sentence uh, answers to each of those questions. And hopefully that will give staff direction, gives me direction, and, and all of us an idea of how, how this committee is doing. Uh, with that, let's go on to the next item, which is a report um, from the um, 
Oh, well, Council Member uh, Rodriguez is not here, uh, but uh, working group report. And to give that, we're going to have uh, Alex Warner, and he's going to be on Zoom, I think. Uh, and he's uh, with the city of San Diego, will provide us uh, an update. Good morning, Chair Chu and committee members. Um, my name is Alex Warner, and I'm the chair of the ASTAC Sandac Social Services Transportation Advisory Council. For those who, of you who don't know, ASTAC is made up of local transit agencies, service providers, and individuals, individuals who have a vested interest uh, in transportation issues facing older San Diegans, those with visual impairments and limited mobility. At ASTAC recent meetings, we have heard reports and provided input, input on several SANDAC projects. Recently, ASTAC has been involved in the data-driven planning process for the regional plan in collaboration with other working groups at SANDAC's joint working group forum. ASTAC members and others decide how best pro to provide adequate services for older citizens and residents with disabilities. All the projects presented at ASTA committee meetings were regional safety programs updates, including a new Vision Zero Action Plan, an update to the regional active transportation plan, and a new safety data dashboard that transportation committee just here as well. Uh, another, all the projects are intersection improvements as part of the Bayshore Bikeway Barrio Logan project, which will provide access to the Blue Line trolley, the bikeway and connections to the local community while accounting for ADA compliant crosses. At ASTA, we also hear from committee members and the public about unmet transit needs across the region, both as part of our committee to a more accessible San Diego. We will continue to listen to our members and the public throughout the year. Our next meeting will be Tuesday, January 16th, a new year. And I'm happy to be here and say again that we thank you for having it, having us this morning. And we're happy to continue this dialogue and collaborate closer, closely with the Transportation Committee. Um, happy holidays, everyone. Thank you, Alex. Uh, before we go, let's see if we have any public comments on this item. Francesca. Thank you, Chair. We do. Uh, Blair Beekman will be first if you'd like to step up to the podium, followed by the original draw. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman. Thanks a lot for this item. Uh, a, a goodbye once again to the uh, former uh, CEO and a hello and a welcome to the new CEO. Uh, it was nice. She talked about uh, issues of Tijuana today. You know, I, I moved here a year and a half ago now, and I was just amazed at how Sandag and uh, works with issues, uh, border issues, uh, and with Tijuana. Um, I, I think it's like really helping in this somewhat difficult time uh, in the Middle East. Uh, I think it's it develops ideas of peace, how we can work in peace uh, with with Mexico at this time. It, it does a lot, <laughs> amazingly a lot. So. Good luck and continued good work uh, in in these sort of efforts. Uh, 2024 will be a really good year for uh, Tijuana San Diego relations, and um, a very much of a thank you to uh, ch uh, was chairperson, not chairperson, but uh, board person, uh, committee person Moreno, who uh, spoke. Uh, very nicely uh, on, on the subject of the future of the toll road. Uh, it was just nice to hear and nice that you're talking about it in the way you are. And uh, good luck that we, uh, in our efforts to continue to uh, really consider uh, the future of the issue, even as it was initially a toll road, good luck at just how we can be open to uh, decisions about it in, in its future. And uh, I guess that's about it for myself on this item. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be the original draw. You can go ahead when you're ready. 
Yeah, everything that actually is happening with the toll road is pretty sad because you guys are sitting here, you know, worried because the press brought it out and you should be paying that off with the 265 million transnet funds that didn't get spent on the 805 expansion. Um, but when we're talking about older citizens and the disabled um, and putting them in these uh, lithium bombs, um, it's actually, you know, really terrifying to think about because you're not being, again, honest with the people that they are, you know, potentially could blow up in the vehicle um, or, you know, have something happen so they can't get out. And, you know, I've been, um, I guarantee none of you have been paralyzed in a wheelchair before and you're not elderly. So you don't necessarily know what you're putting these people um, in, what kind of a condition you're putting them in. Um, and I think that it's terrifying if I was still paralyzed to be, um, in an electric vehicle that I could potentially not be able to get out of because they have ramps on these vehicles that depending on where it is, sometimes they go underneath the van or um, sometimes they'll come out from where the door is. Um, and so it's just terrifying to think that it could potentially not open or you could be just stuck in there and these vehicles continue to blow up if they do start to blow up. And, you know, we're not even we're more concerned, like the city of San Diego is more concerned about losing trash trucks uh, and paying two million dollars for those because lithium batteries were put in there. But we don't ever talk about like the fact that people could potentially explode in these. And the fact that they're um, also, you know, just emit a bunch of radiation from them. You know, we talk about doing like, you know, being all health and safety and all of this stuff, but you completely ignore things that, you know, put, put people in serious danger. Um, you just want to ignore it. So you, and you care more about losing a trash truck than you do about losing anybody's life. But I mean, if we're here to depopulate people, then I guess who cares, right? That concludes the public comments. Uh, thank you. Do we have any member comments or questions so for Alex? And that was our information item. So let's uh, move on to item uh, three, um, it's the consent calendar. So the consent calendar, uh, let's see, moving to the consent calendar, unless uh, members have, would like to have it pulled, we can move on to the consent calendar. Do we, I need to also go into public comments. Do we have any public comments for the consent calendar? Hearing none. No, I'm sorry, do, do you ask for public comments? Yes. Yes, we do have public comments. Uh, first is Blair Beekman, followed by the original draw. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman. Uh, just to try to quickly offer uh, on your approval of meeting minutes uh, from last uh, December uh, 1st, uh, you had an item uh, about the future of traffic safety, vision zero issues. The work, uh, I, I, my main life is considering the future of tech accountability and openness and just how uh, it can work very well with the future of vision zero towards the, the ideas of community harmony and a holistic sense of building a community that I think is really important to Vision Zero. If you have really good tech accountability where the people are a part of the process and a part of all the technology that will be placed in Vision Zero, uh, that is uh, really good. <laughs> That's really building a sustainable future and how to consider a, sustain a sustainable future. And uh, we had a person here from, uh, uh, Guadalajara, Mexico, and, and I think we all know the work they do in their in their city building. That is can be a great example of what Vision Zero can be about. That's community harmony, and that's I think what tech accountability can really help towards with a, a Vision Zero future. So good luck in the efforts, uh, you know, environmentally, tech accountability to address to address Vision Zero, and to quickly offer in being from uh, the Bay Area. Uh, San Jose specifically, their uh, county uh, transit agency is starting to question the future of electric battery use and considering possibly uh, uh, hydrogen fuel cell as, as possibly a more uh, safer means of transport uh, to, to offer transportation in the future. Um, they're questioning it. 
And that's that's an important first step to be able to openly question. And uh, so good for them. I hope that can be of help in deciding uh, your current debate on the future of uh, electric battery and hydrogen fuel cell use. Thank you. So, excuse me. So Blair, uh, it's uh, it's nice to see you in person here. But uh, for f in the future, as we comment on the minutes, it's usually on the accuracy of the minutes or if there's any additions or, or deletions. It's not bringing up all the topics of, of the previous meeting. Sorry about Thank that. You. you caught me. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker will be the original draw. You can go ahead. Actually, Jack, you cannot determine what um, can be said in the two minutes that you give us to talk about the minutes. You can't say, well, you can only talk about this part of the minutes. If it's in the minutes, we can talk about whatever it is because you guys had something for teleworking that was very disturbing. And I don't care if you don't want to hear this or not, but <laughs> it's ridiculous that you sit there and think that you can abridge free speech. It's bullshit. I mean, um, but you guys sit here and you're talking about teleworking like you missed an opportunity when people died during that whole thing. Um, this whole pandemic and you were using it as a means to get people to, out of their cars. And it's very disturbing to hear you guys talk about like a missed opportunity that, you know, it didn't work as well as you had hoped that, you know, what are we going to have to like, we need to do more to mitigate um, this type of an issue because we can't have people driving. Um, so the way that you guys talk about stuff and, and use things um, to push an agenda is very sad because like I said, people died and you're using that as a means to get people out of their cars. And I don't think that those people would appreciate being, you know, used and abused like that when, you know, they already were just from, you know, the whole scam of that and, and being injected with a bioweapon. Um, but you want to sit here and like tout like you guys have all these great plans and you're using the people. I don't care, Jack. I can say whatever I want because that is not your time to determine what free speech is. It's a First Amendment right. You have a general comment. You, that chance no, that, no, no. I still have 25 seconds. That a precedence in which you can make use this as a, a, a general comment period. It is on the consent item, which is the uh, minutes. Um, uh, Francesca, do we have any comments or any uh, changes or deletions to, to this consent item from the board members? That concludes the public comments. Yeah. If, uh, Council Member Moreno. Happy to make a motion to accept the Thank item. you. Moved by Council Member Moreno. Do we have a second, second by, by Jules? Uh, so let's go ahead and vote on the consent calendar. Do I have a voting thing? What do you need? Yeah, this is what is it? It's been hijacked. That, is that each time? Oh, well, I just took a verbal one. Yeah, I saw verbal. So, Francesca, I'm going to uh, vote aye in case you didn't get mine. Thank you for noting that for the record. Uh, that motion passes unanimously with those members present. Thank you. Uh, so, next item is number four. Marissa, will you uh, present to, uh, the budget amendment to the uh, Office of Traffic Safety and Grant Awards? Good morning, hey, I'm everyone. sorry, it's Marissa. Thank you, Chair Shu. A couple weeks ago, I was here with my colleagues to talk about traffic safety data and planning. And as a follow-up to that, we have some good news to share in that we have been awarded some traffic safety uh, grant funds from the California Office of Traffic Safety to help us develop and deploy an educational marketing campaign around newly enacted road rules. There's a lot that happens every year in our legislature and it impacts our California Vehicle Code. And there's not always awareness about how some of the road rules are changing and impacting all people that are using the roads, drivers, walkers, and bikers alike. So we've been fortunate enough to get our feet wet with this new grant program that we've applied for for the first time. And it's an annual program through the Office of Traffic and Safety using federal highway safety program funds. We're going to use the $400,000 to develop a really targeted educational marketing campaign that includes digital tools like social media and also physical marketing tactics like potentially billboards and even transit vehicle wraps, some of the best moving billboards that we can have in the region. 
Uh, we even have some expressed interest from Caltrans in supporting the effort, so we'll be talking to them soon. And the grant program is annual, so every fall to fall, there's a grant cycle which with, within which you can uh, use the funds to do your programming. In most cases, local cities have police departments that apply for these funds to help with traffic enforcement efforts uh, in an effort to reduce uh, fatalities and severe injuries related to impaired driving, and we're going to use it to uh, develop this educational marketing campaign. And I just have a couple of road rules examples that we'll likely be focusing on as part of this campaign. One example is that in January 1st of this year, 2023, the California Vehicle Code now requires drivers to treat people biking as another vehicle in terms of how they pass them. So vehicles, if there's another lane available, have to use that, that lane to pass a person on a bike, just like they would uh, passing another vehicle on the road. And then in about, in about two weeks, on January 1st, 2024, uh, it will be legal for people riding bikes to cross through an intersection at the same time pedestrians can on the walk signal. So that's going to be truly pivotal. Our intersections are places where there's a lot of incidents that happen between uh, all modes, cars turning right, cars proceeding, and this helps to give uh, people riding bikes that head start along with pedestrians any at any intersection where there's that leading pedestrian inter interval for uh, uh, between three and seven seconds. Very short presentation, but we're here to ask the Transportation Committee to accept the awarded funds to help us with this, this initiative. Thank you, uh, Francesca. Do we have any public comments on this item? We do. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first will be Blair Beekman, followed by Manny Rodriguez. All right, thank you, uh, Blair Beekman. Um, interestingly, um, on the uh, the meeting minutes of December 1st, item seven is about San Diego regional medium and heavy duty zero emission vehicle uh, blueprint. So my words actually uh, did have a precedence and did have a point. Uh, I, I, I referred to this, I thought I'd read it, so I re returned to it and there it is. So. Uh, Thanks for the original DRA's words about garbage truck issues, what we're doing. So with that all said, uh, to, to move on to this item, um, I'm not too uh, keen on advertising and billboards, and I, I'm understanding the city of San Diego has a really good policy on billboards. I think the future of electronic billboards and digital wayfinding is questionable and that we have to make a very serious effort to really be more open and honest and accountable exactly what those technologies are doing and what they're capable of and what they're actually doing. You're really afraid as a, as a board, as, as government officials, to talk with the community about what it is actually doing. And what original DRA said at the beginning of the meeting, in five years from now, we're gonna look back at this time of how we talked about these things as fairly ridiculous because we're gonna have a lot more knowledge and understanding. I think we should be doing those things now to, to work towards a clarity. And uh, I'm not a fan of, of this sort of use of data collection and technology and surveillance, basically. I, I, I don't want that future. And it has to be really guarded and not really considered innovative. And we have to be very careful how we move forward with these sort of things to be, and to be used as minimally as possible, I feel. Uh, and the wraparounds with buses, I, I'm on the bus all the time. I can't see out the window with those wraparounds. It's a pain. Please stop using them, I feel. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Manny Rodriguez, followed by the original draw. Good afternoon, Transportation Committee. I want to thank Marissa Mangan for her good work in securing this funding from the OTS and her team as well. Vision Zero is something really important to me. You know, I have younger family members and younger siblings, and I want them to be able to walk around town, bike around town, skate around town. And every time they do, I always worry a little bit that, you know, they might get hit or, you know, get in some kind of traffic collision. And every year, it seems that the traffic collisions just keep on rising and rising. So that worry gets greater and greater. So I think this is good work, and I look forward to the educational campaign they'll be working on, and I hope this committee you know, we'll continue to prioritize Vision Zero and keeping all of us safe. Thank you. 
think our next speaker will be the original draw. You can go ahead. Yeah, there's more problems and crashes because you have people like Jack crossing the street expecting cars to stop for him. <laughs> uh, anywho, yeah, I don't know why we're spending money on like advertising and all of this stuff, billboards, right? And like all of these stupid rules that continue to be pushed down the pipe, like treat a bike like a vehicle. <laughs> Like, and you guys wonder why there's crashes with bikes like it's so sad because you guys don't see exactly like I don't know if you don't see it or you do and you're just really happy with yourselves like because what you're doing is just psychopathic is what it is I mean especially thinking that you can cross the road and that cars will stop for you I'm just gonna cross I'm just gonna do it and if the cars don't stop it's their fault and then I'll sue them I mean, it's it's pretty um, sad and, and you, you aren't transparent with the people, um, you know, like Blair's saying, I mean, because you guys don't want, I mean, you don't even let us talk on items. You tell us what we can say, right? Oh, you can't say that. You can only say this. And so I'm going to push mute. Like you guys have just so much power that you, like, that, did you, oh my gosh, but that, you know what? The road to hell is paved with good intentions. And that's exactly where you're sending us because of all of this stuff, the way that you are, you know, <clears throat> demonizing driving all while, you know, changing all these rules so that people have to walk and bike everywhere. And now they can be on the road. Eventually, you're just going to be like, you can only go five miles an hour. So you might as well get out of your car. You're not even going to want to be in it. I mean, it is so sad to see that people don't. Oh, that they thank you for this kind of stuff. They're like thanking you for enslaving them and using our own money to do it and using money for like advertising when you can't be actually fixing roads. But it's like, why? We don't want to do that because that'll incentivize people to drive, right? Oh, talk about behaviors, you guys. <laughs> Whoa. That concludes the public comments on this item. Thank you, Francesca. Do we have any member comments or questions? Let's start with Councilmember Moreno and then Jules and I'll come yeah. over to us. Right? Um, I'm happy to make a motion to move staff's recommendation and just congratulations to staff and thank you for your hard work. Thank you, Councilmember. Um, Ms. Hudson. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Marissa, for the presentation. I just had a quick question um, with regard to the bus and light rail vehicle wraps. Would that include coaster and sprinter or would it be limited to trolley as far as light rail? When we applied for the grant and priced things out, we were looking at light rail and bus vehicles, including rear wraps and side wraps, not blocking window views, by the way, because I'm not a fan of that, but those were the two. Well, thank you very much for that, and I'd like to second that motion. Thank you. Moves and second that. Do we have more comments? Councilman Zito and then Raphael. Yeah, thanks again. Uh, really good work and great effort. Um, I think any, any type of communication that we're able to do to continue to remind people that there are other users of the road is helpful um, as we go through this. A quick question. So was a grant specifically written to only advertise or communicate the new, the new rules or the new laws that have passed? We crafted our application about new road rules because we already do have some state active transportation grant funds to educate on new road features. So they'll kind of go hand in hand as well. Okay. Yeah. I just, I would encourage us, you know, I don't, you know, maybe we can slip it in, but if we could actually use some analysis of what are the root causes of existing accidents and be able to communicate issues around that as well. I mean, personally, there are behaviors that I see that that um, might be useful to advertise and, and note like the fact that you're not supposed to be either, you're not supposed to be operating any kind of vehicle wearing headphones or iPods or over the ear headphones. And I see this all the time and I don't know if it causes crashes, but actually being able to communicate some of the other more appropriate, uh, uh, appropriate behaviors that will help us increase our safety and reduce crashes would be useful. I mean, to one of the speaker's points, I even all the time am fascinated about how many times I have someone who's walking down the road, looking at their phone, wearing earbuds, and steps right in front of me in a bike path. Doesn't even bother to look, right? And I have to do some crazy maneuver not to hit them. So, you know, being able to educate people as to what all users' responsibilities are and and knowing what the data says about why crashes happen would be useful. But I understand if this the way this grant was written, uh, I, as I said at the beginning, any communication is better than none. So I appreciate that. Thanks. Raphael, go ahead. 
And I just want to thank you for the work on this. As a cyclist that's experienced cars literally trying to run me off the road because they think they have the right to do so, I think it's super critical to educate drivers out there that that's not their right and that there is uh, rules of the road, especially the new ones coming in the coming year. So just wanted to thank you for your work on that. Great. I also want to also thank staff for you know, getting this grant and make, moving forward. Um, we need a lot more education for our drivers. Uh, so the most, oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, Caltrans. Uh, thank you, Joshua. I wanted to thank Marisa. Yes, we are really excited about uh, the opportunity to partner on this campaign. I think I mentioned it a couple of weeks ago that we can just engineer our way out of uh, fatalities and serious injuries, and and public education is a is an important component of this. So we're really excited about this. Like uh, Council Member Zero mentioned, uh, there needs to be also uh, some public education about old rules as well. Uh, and maybe not with this funding, but with other initiatives, just something as basic as wearing a seatbelt. Uh, I cannot tell you how many pages I get about fatalities that people that get ejected from their vehicles when they roll over because they're not wearing a seatbelt. And occupants in vehicles that are wearing seatbelts uh, can survive uh, given the safety characteristics of vehicles nowadays. So. Um, I'm really excited about this. I think it's going to make a difference. So thank you for all your work. Thank you, Gustavo. Councilman Duncan. If I heard correctly, I think there was a motion on the floor to accept the funds. It may not have been seconded. And if that's correct, then I'm happy to by, uh, Oh, seconded. Well, then I would third it. And thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. So any other comments? If not, uh, we have a motion that was uh, moved by Councilman Moreno and seconded by Councilman Edson. Please go ahead and vote. Thank you very much, uh, Marissa, for making the presentation. That motion passes unanimously with those members present. Great, let's go on to uh, item number five. Uh, Zach is here to present the results of the Youth Opportunity Pass, so. Good morning, Transportation Committee, and thank you, Chair Shu. It's great to be here with you this morning. Uh, my name is Zachary Brott. I'm an associate regional planner here at Sandag. Um, and for the past year and a half or so, we've been uh, implementing the Youth Opportunity Pass. Uh, and for the past uh, few months, we've been uh, developing a report, uh, really evaluating how it's been doing um, and what's gonna, how it's going to keep going uh, in the future. And so I'm happy to share this with you this morning. Um, as I'm sure many of you are aware, the Youth Opportunity Pass is part of Sandag's commitment to equity and an early action item of the 2021 regional plan. Uh, and SANDAC has been partnering with schools, community-based organizations, and other social equity stakeholders around the region in order to implement and distribute uh, the, the program. It's funded mostly by SANDAG with support from the County of San Diego um, in order to support MTS and NCTD's uh, fair revenue uh, and recovery. We don't wanna shortchange our transit operators um, while we implement this program. And so we're happy to uh, fund this program uh, to support their bottom line. We launched the program last May, as many of you are probably aware. And as of about six weeks ago, the program is now funded through June of 2026, uh, thanks to action taken by the Sandag Board of Directors uh, in October. So we're really happy that uh, the board uh, and everyone else seems to uh, realize the benefits that this program has provided and has committed to continuing to fund the program uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, since last spring, we've distributed over 55,000 uh, free youth pronto cards along with our partners at MTS, NCTD, uh, our CBOs, and our schools uh, in, or for, in order for uh, youth throughout the region who don't have a cell phone or something like that to access the system uh, to have a way to get on transit. And because of that, there's now over 150,000 uh, total youth pronto accounts active. So that's over 150,000 youth throughout the region who have uh, signed up and ridden transit uh, at least one time in the past year and a half. And we see those results when we look at the number of youth who are now riding transit. Uh, this graph here shows the total number of uh, individual youth riding transit. So each number here is a specific person who has tapped onto the bus or the trolley or the coaster uh, or the sprinter uh, at least one time per month. And as you can see, before the program launched last spring, we were hovering around 15 or 16,000 youth who were using the transit system every month uh, after the program is implemented, we've crested more than 50,000. 
um, and are hovering around 40, 45,000 a month on average, especially during the school year. When we look at the total number of rides that youth are taking on transit, this is also significantly increased. Uh, you can see here the green and purple representing MTS and NCTD, uh, but both agencies have seen a significant increase uh, from a total of around 350,000 total rides taken by youth before the program. And now we're regularly seeing over 800, sometimes over 900,000 rides a month. Uh, so we're really, really excited about this. As you can see, the, the peaks during the school year, um, a little bit less during the summer, but even that we're still seeing increases uh, compared to what we had before the program. So it's really great to see our youth getting out on transit and being able to use the system and get around San Diego County uh, thanks to this program. Some of our highest ridership routes that we like to look at, these are routes that uh, serve a large number of youth in terms of raw numbers and also have seen a huge increase, um, more than double, sometimes triple what they saw before the program were implemented um, are really spread throughout the county. So we see up in North County, um, Breeze routes 303 and 305, uh, connecting all the way along uh, the corridor from Oceanside to Vista into Escondido. Um, huge increases on those routes, um, more than double the previous ridership and each one serving uh, over, I believe, 500 uh, youth every day. And then in South County, in the MTS service area, we also see sent, uh, many routes with these significant increases. Just three that I like to highlight here are Route 44, which serves a lot of youth in Linda Vista um, and Kearney Mesa, connecting them to schools, other transit connections uh, at Old Town and some other transit centers. Uh, Route 13, uh, which serves a lot of youth in City Heights and uh, Southeastern San Diego and National City, uh, connecting them to the trolley uh, and schools and healthcare centers uh, when they need them. And finally, in the South Bay, we see Route 709, uh, which uh, serves youth in Chula Vista uh, from the western end of Chula Vista all the way into the east, uh, connecting them again to schools, uh, as well as the trolley and our, our rapid network. As part of our evaluation of the program, we worked with the San Diego Unified School District, um, who were a very willing partner and uh, happy to um, coordinate with them. We looked at attendance uh, at schools throughout the district. Um, the San Diego Unified School District serves around 40% of the total public schools uh, in the county, so we thought it was a pretty good sample um, from a wide variety of different types of communities. We looked at schools that were close to transit within a quarter mile of a transit stop and compared them to schools that were farther away from transit. And our initial results showed that schools close to transit had an attendance uh, recovery that was 27% stronger than schools that were farther away from transit. And so we saw a lot of um, schools and, and youth um, being more absent and not being as in school during the pandemic and coming out of the pandemic. Uh, now schools are starting to see that attendance recover and it's happening faster at schools near transit um, in San Diego. And so this is something that we can continue to study um, perhaps get more partners and, and evaluate more districts throughout the region. Uh, but our initial results do show promising um, school attendance and re uh, recovery figures, uh, which is great because we can uh, see this uh, helping to narrow the achievement gap uh, in a lot of our schools. A lot of um, our more historically disadvantaged communities have seen uh, tougher times in terms of attendance uh, historically. I and mean, a lot of those uh, neighborhoods are the ones that are close to transit and those students rely on transit a lot. And so we're really happy to uh, see that achievement gap narrowing and we'll continue to study this to see what other, uh, what other insights we can ascertain uh, in the future as the Youth Opportunity Pass continues. We also conducted a comprehensive study, uh, including a survey that was uh, taken by over 1,100 youth throughout the region uh, and uh, three sets of focus groups that we did with youth in this um, study, we found that 92% of youth said that they ride public transit more now than they did before the pass uh, was in existence, and that um, almost four out of five youth uh, say that they plan to keep riding transit when they're adults, which is great to hear. Um, we love to be able to build up this culture of transit uh, in San Diego and encourage youth that there's more than just one way to get around. And so as our um, pass continues and as our transit system continues to develop, uh, we hope to continue to capture that ridership uh, and, and really build this culture of transit even more uh, for, for the next generation of San Diegans. Some things that we found uh, in this study when, when youth were asked to, to share their opinions uh, were that the past has helped them save money. It helps them and their family uh, spend less money on transportation, uh, put that money towards other things they need like rent or paying their bills and their groceries. Um, so that's really great to see. 
you said that it reduces stress and worry for them. So they're able to get to school easier, participate in more things, um, not be as much of a burden in terms of transportation costs and other sorts of transportation issues for their family. We heard that a lot of youth are really helping their family with responsibilities, whether that's uh, helping take care of an older grandparent, um, taking their siblings around, um, younger siblings. And so something that the Youth Opportunity Pass uh, that the youth said was helpful was that it helps them balance those responsibilities. Um, we heard from some uh, youth in our focus groups, um, some 13, 14 year olds who are the cutest kids you've ever seen. And they said that the Youth Opportunity Pass has helped them to you know, take their younger brother with them to school and then they can get around um, without being a burden on their parents. Uh, something else that youth said was that it helps them get more places and do more activities. We heard a lot of people saying that they were able to go to the beach or take the coaster, which is not um, something that youth used to do, um, and get around and get to um, more fun places, spend out, to hang out with friends, um, and, and do after-school activities um, because of the, the Youth Opportunity Pass and the transportation options that it provided for them. And the last major theme that we identified was that it allows independence. A lot of youth uh, mentioned that they don't have to wait around for their parents or their friends' parents to, to take them somewhere or give them a ride. Um, so the pass has allowed them to um, do more things, become more independent, and really explore the region on their own. We had um, a lot of quotes from the survey and the focus groups that we drew these from. Some that I like to highlight here um, are that youth mentioned that it's helped them out financially and that they feel safe on transit. Uh, that they don't have to rely as much on their parents and they feel like they're being more friendly to the environment um, and that they're be able to be involved more in their community uh, and don't have to wait around for their parents uh, to get them around, uh, and, as well as helping them a lot uh, with getting to school uh, without a car. We also evaluated the, the potential greenhouse gas impacts of the program, uh, looking at the um, ridership numbers and comparing them to previous ridership numbers using the same methodology that we use for the regional plan. Um, so annually, what we found was that the program has reduced around 7 million vehicle miles traveled uh, across the region, uh, which equates to a savings of approximately 250,000 gallons of gas for uh, the, the region's families, uh, which with the price of gas being so high nowadays uh, is a really large burden relieved uh, for our local families. Um, and all of this am amounts to uh, almost 5 million pounds of CO2 reduced uh, in terms of our regional emissions. And all of these, again, are annual numbers. So we've had the program uh, in existence for around a year and a half now. Um, so you, this will continue to scale up as the program continues. As we continue to look forward for the, the, regional, the Youth Opportunity Pass, sorry, um, as I mentioned, we have the Youth Opportunity Pass uh, for 18 and under currently funded through June of 2026. Uh, we're currently embarking on a transit fare discount program study um, here at Sandag, which will evaluate um, potential opportunities uh, for expanding transit fare discounts, ensuring that transit uh, stays affordable and accessible to all people throughout the region, uh, while also balancing that with ensuring that we continue to provide a high quality transit service to everyone throughout the region. Uh, and of course, we're gonna continue uh, coordinating with our state, regional, local partners uh, for permanent funding for the program, um, we want to be able to provide this opportunity for uh, San Diegans for generations to come. So with that, uh, that concludes our presentation and I'm happy to uh, take any questions. Great, uh, Francesca, do we have any public comments? We do. Uh, first, uh, we'll have Manny Rodriguez followed by Blair Beekman. And after Blair, we'll start with Alex Wong on Zoom. Good afternoon, Transportation Committee. My name is Manny Rodriguez. I'm here on behalf of the City Heights Community Development Corporation, City Heights CDC, and other orgs like Mid-City Can and other City Heights Mid-City organizations push for this. It's been decades in the making. We're happy to see it. We knew it would bring exactly the type of benefits Zach talked about, save families money, um, provide kids with reliable form of transportation to get to school, to do groceries, you know, to do responsibilities, and also build that independence and, you know, connect people closer to their communities and not you know, have their ability to go somewhere, see someone be restricted by their parents being around, which if they're working, you know, two jobs or long hours, then they're essentially stuck at home. So we're happy to see this and we hope it can continue to be funded. Um, I'm glad to see them in the benefits over quarter million, sorry, quarter of a million in gas saved, you know, it's well over a million dollars in gas 
And, you know, that's money that gets reinvested back into our local community, not to Exxon or whatever company. That's money that stays here in San Diego. And I would also like to see some studies about how, you know, how many of the people with YOP that grow out of it continue to use transit because a lot of kids did not use transit before YOP, but now they're using it. And now that they know the system, they're comfortable with it. They're going to keep using it. Many of them, I would argue most of them, will use it in some capacity after growing out of it, which is just an additional customer base for MTS. So this is just not, you know, this can also be seen as an investment in growing our transit user base and growing our fare collection in the long run, because you're creating a culture of transit and adding more customers in the future. Thank you, and I hope we can continue to fund this. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Blair Beekman, followed by Alex Wong. Hi, Blair Beekman. My feelings and ideas grew a little strong on the previous item. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I work with openness and accountability ideas, and that works best towards friendly dialogue and conversation. So, sorry. Um, for this item, uh, I'm interested in how, um, yeah, I, I've heard nothing but good things about, you know, the youth program, and it's nice you're talking about it again here at this time. Um, in San Jose, where I'm from, uh, I'm, I think I mentioned here a few times now, the Bay Area, they're starting to really consider a regional free pass system uh, as how to address their issues. And I know that SANDAG here is, it may be a bit more apprehensive towards the idea, but I just thought I would mention it this time as, as a reference and choices you can have to add to the future of this really good youth program. And to again note that uh, I, I've been a proponent of uh, more buses along a route at one time. Uh, it offers more convenience and uh, availability, uh, you know, a routine that uh, it makes it easier to know you can quickly catch a bus uh, sooner. And maybe that can be a part of the future of these uh, items. Oh, and of course, uh, ride share. Uh, we're having a difficult time that I think we're navigating through here. It's been nice to watch that evolve. Uh, ride sharing is as an issue that uh, uh, pertains to youth and, and to adults and, and how good practices we do with the Youth Commission, how that can uh, transfer to uh, adult services and uh, good luck and all that. And I'd love to hear how the future of advertising on buses can make it easier for me to see through the windows. So thank you for your time. I think our next speaker will be Alex Wong, followed by Ariana Federico. The Youth Opportunity Pass has undeniably helped many youth, and I support its continuation. However, I don't think new fare discounts for those above 18 would be effective in increasing transit ridership. The YOP works because it targets youth who are overwhelmingly below the legal driving age and are too early in their careers to have saved up enough money for a car. But once youth advance in their careers, they will likely work farther away from home and have saved up enough money to buy a car then transit travel time becomes more important than the price of transit. Even in low-income inner-city areas like National City, most commutes are made by car, not by transit. That's not because transit is too expensive. The full price of 12 monthly passes is still much cheaper than driving a Honda Civic for 5,000 miles per year. It's because transit is too infrequent, unreliable, and slow. Sandag also needs to not just ask existing riders uh, if they value cheaper fares or frequency more, but also ask people who don't ride transit why they don't ride transit. To meet climate goals and achieve modal shift, it's essential to get people of all income demographics on board. As former mayor of Bogota, Gustavo Petro said, a developed country is not one where the poor drive cars, it's a country where the rich take public transportation. People who drive to work aren't going to switch to transit when transit becomes cheaper. They're going to switch when transit becomes faster and more frequent. And the more choice riders you have who are Paying full price fares, the more fare discounts you can offer to low income riders without having to delay or scale back frequency increases. In conclusion, Sandag should prioritize maximizing frequency on core transit routes to attract choice riders who would then pay full price fares that will pay for free or discounted fares for low income riders. This is how we can achieve both climate and equity goals. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ariana Federico, followed by Brisetas and Cisneros. Good morning, Transportation Committee members. My name is Ariana Federico. I'm the organizing director here with Mid-City CAN. 
Um, and in my workload, I work directly with the transportation team, ITCH, who has advocated along with many community members for the Youth Opportunity Pass program. We're really excited to see the outcomes of the, the program. We, we knew that it would provide opportunities for a lot of young people and their families in our community for them to get to school, to work, to internships, to medical um, appointments. We know that it's saving folks money, that it's 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 letting them get to places that they haven't been there before. You know, when I was growing up, I, I would ride transportation and I actually used the Route 13 um, often coming from Southeast to City Heights. So I'm really happy to see that that route is um, being used by many students um, that are that are commuting. Um, I'm also really excited to hear more about the greenhouse impact, greenhouse gas impacts. Um, we know that transportation needs to be, it is a solution to reducing, um, you know, vehicle miles traveled, to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And I think that this could be a good opportunity to continue to invest not only in the youth in um, youth opportunities, but also in um, climate um, solutions. So we hope that you know this continues to be as of a priority to to Sandag to the transportation agencies that we work with at MTS and NCTD, and we hope that there's continuous conversation about making this program more permanent for all young people that are 18 and under. Thank you for your time. I think our next speaker will be Brisada Cisneros, followed by the original draw. Brisita, you are self-muted at the moment, so you can begin whenever you're ready. Bye. Hello? Yeah? Okay. Hola, mi nombre es Brisita Cisneros, y tengo cinco hijos, y este, tengo, um, soy de Michilicán, de los, de las, de los bases de los autobuses, de los jóvenes, pues, a mí me ha ayudado mucho los, los pases, porque mis hijos ocupan los, los pases para ir, este, a, a la escuela y ahorita que tienen este los pases eh, me ha ahorrado yo la verdad mucho este en eh, económicamente porque cuando vamos a la escuela antes no teníamos este um, cómo cómo transportarnos y pues la verdad que sí ha sido un buen un beneficio para la para muchas personas y para la comunidad porque este para mi hija la que lleva a la universidad al colegio ella este eh, um, ahora ella ya lo ocupa del diario ¿por qué? porque ella este es un beneficio que ella para ella se está beneficiando porque sin un, ese pase pues ellos este um, te, tenían que batallar más verdad para la escuela muchos niños hasta dejan sus estudios por pues este para ir a la escuela entonces y también está reduciendo las los lo de los lo de los uh, cuando para los de, de contaminación, ¿verdad? La contaminación este, se está reduciendo más, menos porque este, los niños jóvenes, he visto muchos jóvenes que este, ahorita en la escuela, en el, en el, este, cuando van en el BAS 13, muchos jóvenes usan el, el transporte y eso me, me, da, este, me da alegría porque este, con los pases ellos este, tienen más oportunidades de hacer sus actividades, de ir a donde quiera, ¿verdad? Y pues este y me gustaría que no fuera un, un programa piloto que fuera un programa permanente para que este uh, se ayudaran la, económicamente las familias gracias I think our next speaker will be the original draw followed by Cristina Marquez and Cristina will be our final commenter yeah um you know with the youth I mean it's a little bit terrifying to think that unaccompanied minors can be riding on the buses with um, or transit with a bunch of illegals who cross the border, uh, military aged men um, that can also ride for free, which is a little bit weird because it's like you don't let 
other people like in the community ride for free you do it for the youth and then if these people cross the border illegally you're just like here we'll give you a bus pass and take you wherever well in fact you know what else we'll do we'll put wi-fi right by the bus stop and all this other stuff and give you like a five thousand dollar gift card it's so great um but if you want more people to be riding you should be making it more convenient because i mean youths can sit there and, and waste their day riding public transit but most adults have um don't have time to spare and um be waiting around to you know commute when it could they could get there a lot quicker um with um driving um but i think that if you can do this for youth and you can do this for um 50,000 illegal immigrants or just crossers of the border um who are going to probably be in our military and police off um law enforcement soon uh you should be able to do it for you know the rest of the community if you really want people to be riding uh this kind of and using this kind of transit um you know if people can places can do it elsewhere you could find a way to do it but at the same time it's not necessarily um as convenient as it could be um the you know people have more trouble getting around somewhere and it takes like twice to three times as long as if they were to take um their own mode of transportation which you guys say is so dangerous right i mean gosh we got to really educate these drivers they're just so bad um so, yeah, I mean, if you really want, you know, more people to ride it, make it more convenient and give people the passes for free. Our final speaker on this item will be Christina Marquez. You can go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Christina Marquez with IBEW Local 569, the electricians in San Diego and Imperial Counties. Uh, we appreciate you giving us the time to to speak on this. This this is something that's more on the equity line, and we we support this. And we hope that the youth opportunity passes can be something that can be permanent. Um, especially you know just hearing that from Brasida Cisneros who called in, you know saying how she had five has five children and this has helped her immensely. That right there makes this all the worthwhile and we need to keep pushing forward and fighting to find some way to make this, um, like I said, permanent. Uh, IBEW 569 wholeheartedly uh, supports this and uh, are happy to to work with you to, to see how we can push this forward to get people out of vehicles and get them into public transportation, um, you know, giving this uh, more public transportation and ridership, then we can show and prove that there are people that want to ride and we can expand and we can move uh, move these times from you know 30 minutes, 20 minutes to 10 minutes, coming in every 10 minutes and hoping we can work on that. Thank you very much and have a great day, everyone. Thank you. We do actually have one more public speaker. Denise Lopez uh, will be our final speaker. You can go ahead. Oh, hello. My name is Denise Lopez. I'm from the community of City Heights. I work with Miss City Can as a volunteer. I want to speak up and talk about the importance of the public transportation, such as the use opportunity passes. As we see in the report, it has increased as uh, it has had an impact as it increased the use ridership. This is as eventually as I'm a student at UCSD and a commuter. So I see youth riding transit from early at 5.30 in the morning all the way up to 4 or 3 p.m. The as bus, as the blue line is being very impactful, we urge for more for more better quality for our public transportation as we are seeing now that more youth are riding transit and I have speak to those use on for for the students who attend Freud's, Freud's uh, middle school slash high school. They have acknowledged that the public transportation has been a uh, a beneficial for them as it's been as it been something that will help them improve their education as as mostly all the students seen that transit has been an impact for them as it helped relieve their families. So as as me, I want to talk about a few students at UCSD. Yes, we want transit to be more improved. As Blue Line is being very impactful for being delayed because a lot of students are in it. So we want the improvement of our public transportation. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. That concludes the public commenters. Thank you, Francesca. Do we have any member comments or questions? Councilmember Moreno. Um, first and foremost, thank you for the presentation. Um, I was wondering, are there any other agencies um, in the state of California doing youth free youth opportunity passes? There are, yeah. There's um, several agencies throughout basically every region of California that have uh, similar uh, youth programs or student programs. Uh, we met with uh, many of them in the development of our program and trying to make sure that we were following best practices. Um, these include uh, the Orange County Transportation Authority, um, LA Metro, um, Muni in San Francisco, as well as um, Sacramento's Regional Transit District. Um, just off the top of my head, I, I know there's others as well. Um, but everyone does it kind of a little bit differently. Um, and so we we all kind of convened to make sure we were using the best practices available. And yeah. Thank you. Um, is there an appetite at the state level to do this just across the state? Uh, I think there's some. It's been explored um, the past two years. There's been uh, some legis legislation proposed um, for some sort of youth opportunity pass um, or youth transit pass pilot program statewide. Um, it unfortunately has not uh, been successful in getting implemented or passed yet um, and acted into law. Um, and and I think the, the funding is kind of limited in the way that it's been written so far. So we've been working uh, with some of our advocates and then in our legislative program uh, to try to push that along. And so we'll see where it goes next year. Wonderful. Well, I think it, it should be clear to everybody that these youth opportunity uh, pass, the past pilot program has been just a humongous success. Um, we've tripled the number of youth riders taking transit in our county. Um, and that's a positive effect of 300%. Um, I don't think we often see results this dramatic. Uh, from public pol uh, policies, right, especially this quickly. Um, MTS trolley has increased 600% across three lines. Um, and I, I do want to point out that um, the 709, the increase of 221%, um, my teenage nieces and nephews definitely partook in that percentage. Um, so this is this is just it's it's amazing. Um, I I we've been saying this at MTS, um, and you know the youth opportunity pass is laying the foundation for future uh, for the future of public transit in San Diego. Um, as many of our youth riders that ride for free today will become paying customers of MTS and NCTD. Um, the other thing that was just, uh, you know, really ast not astonishing, but I, I really appreciate that you did this, was the t attendance recovery. Um, essentially, this is the future of San Diego, right? So we definitely uh, want to um, just do as much as we possibly can. Um, one of the things that I would recommend is, um, I don't know, you, you mentioned that there was a lot of communication with um, San Diego Unified. Uh, and I would welcome Sandag to reach out to Sweetwater Unified as, um, you know, we have the blue line, the, the most important line of, uh, of the system. Um, and 50% of the residents in the South Bay are under the age of 18. So it would behoove us to um, get in partnership get in partnership with uh, Sweetwater Unified. Uh, the other thing that I really appreciated that you put, it was the uh, impact on the environment. Um, that was really neat to see. I'm a visual person, so um, I want to thank Sandag staff for pushing this pilot program forward. Um, I am proud as the past chair of the Social Equity Working Group to have included the Youth Opportunity Pass pilot program as part of the Social Equity Early Action Plan, which was approved by the board. Uh, so thank you to all the members of the Social Equity Working Group for your advocacy uh, for the Early Action Plan. Um, and um, thank you to staff for, for listening to the, to the working group, right? It definitely could have just been something that the working group said and you just we keep on chucking along. Uh, but I think this really, the data on this is just phenomenal and I appreciate you um, outlining that. And that concludes my comments, Chair. Thank you. If I may, thank you very much for your um, work on this, Council Member Moreno, and your comments. And I just wanted to build on what Zach said. 
In terms of the SANDAG legislative program, a key priority is to secure state funding, an ongoing funding program for the Youth Opportunity Pass. And this is something that Sharon Cooney and I have been working on. We've also been working with NCTD. Every time we're in Sacramento, we're asking for funding for Ota Mesa East, Low Sand, Youth Opportunity Pass. And those are the things that we talk about with our legislative delegation, all the state agencies. Gustavo's been there with us doing the same thing. So this is really important. We see the benefits of early investment in this kind of program and what a difference it's making. So all of you come beat the drum with us and we will continue to look for funding to make sure there's an ongoing funding source to keep this going. Let's go with Councilmember Edson and, and Ted Duncan. Thank you. Um, thanks, Zach. And uh, I'd like to echo many of Councilmember Moreno's comments. And um, thank you also, Colleen, for your comments. Um, as I've mentioned in the past, I relied on, on bus to get around as, as a kid and uh, public transportation as an adult as well um, in many places, not so much San Diego, where it wasn't as convenient as an adult to ride. Um, I am a major fan of YOP and have been uh, all of the years that I served on TC, both for my subregion and for NCTD. Um, so it's very exciting to me. And, you know, I, I from the beginning would argue if we do this, they will ride. And if they ride, they will continue to ride as adults because I did. It makes sense, right? Um, NCTD breeze routes, as, as Zach, Zach touched upon, the NCTD breeze routes 303 and 305 have seen among the highest ridership increases in the county since the pilot program's inception in May of 2022. These gains are most significant during the school year. So our, our kids are, are riding to school. I, I mean, what more can we do for them than to get them to school so that they can be, uh, we can have an educated workforce as they move on in their life. So um, as was mentioned by uh, council member Morena, YOP is proven beneficial. And um, I certainly appreciate Sandag finding ways to find, to fund continuing uh, the program in ways that are supportive to the uh, transit agency's bottom line. So thanks so much. Thank you, Councilman Duncan. Thank you for your presentation and congratulations on the program. Uh, I just had a couple of very quick questions. One is, I was curious, I don't know the answer. Has the Youth Opportunity Pass ever been extended to the ferries? You know, I understand there may be some more ferries in development, maybe even from Chula Vista. And I know obviously there's the one between Coronado and in downtown San Diego. And part of the reason I ask is there is a program in place already for commuters who get there by certain hours in the morning to ride free both ways to try to alleviate some traffic. It's not currently applicable to the ferries. Um, <clears throat> We have partnerships with MTS and NCTD for the program and the ferries run by a separate agencies, I'm sure you know. Um, so currently, no. Um, potentially something we could explore in the future, but it's not currently part of the program. Yeah, and that, that's what I thought was probably the case. And I would urge you to consider exploring it. I know everything is limited to a certain extent, obviously, by funding and other things. But it seems like it might be something good, especially if there's additional ferry development uh, in the region. Uh, and the other thing, I just wanted to compliment the program because... Um, while I definitely do believe it has a much, much larger impact in, um, you know, historically underserved, underprivileged communities, I, I do greatly appreciate that it's a countywide program because in every city there are people who are struggling. And um, for instance, even in my hometown of Coronado, there are, you know, military enlisted families on the Amphib base and it's kind of a remote location on the strand and they can use this to get to high school or middle school in the village. They can use it to get to work. They can use it to get to Imperial beach for work or to, or to get into town into San Diego. So thank you. That's one of Mendoza. Um, this is a question or maybe suggestion. You, um, as council member um, Moreno said, um, you mentioned th your partnership with the um, San Diego Unified School District. Have you reached out to, and not necessarily in a partnership, but what uh, have you reached out to um, East County school districts? Um, at Lemon Grove School District in particular has many 
um, under uh, underserved uh, students. Um, also, we have no high school in Lemon Grove. So um, half the town goes to Helix High School in La Mesa, the other half Mount Miguel and Spring Valley. And there really isn't a, a good bus route to either high school from Lemon Grove. Um, it's kind of roundabout, but my uh, granddaughter lived with me and went to Helix High School. And it she it took her about 35 minutes to walk to the bus stop and ride the bus. The whole trip took about 35 minutes, which isn't horrible, but to um, a 14, 15, 16 year old, when your grandma can get you to school in 10 minutes or less, um, getting on the bus for 35 minutes was, you know, excruciating, um, but it is, it, you know, it's doable. So uh, that's my question or suggestion is I just wanna make sure that you're reaching out to other underserved communities. Yeah, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head all of the schools that we've worked with, but starting last spring when we were starting up the program, uh, we worked with several um, school districts and individual schools uh, throughout the county, including in San Diego Unified, Sweetwater, like Councilman Moreno mentioned, um, in East County, up in North County as well, um, to get actual passes distributed to their students and information about the program uh, out to students. Uh, unfortunately, this program can't deal with, um, you know, the roundabout ways that the bus travels sometimes. Um, but we are looking to make improvements, of course, and working with MTS on those things in the future. Uh, and obviously continuing to work with all of the schools uh, throughout the county as we continue the program. Any other board uh, comments or questions? Yep. Uh, just a quick question. I remember hearing a part of the conversation previously was just the discussion about expanding it to 25 and under. Is that on the table or off the table? Uh, that's something that we're evaluating as part of the larger fair discount program study that that I mentioned. Um, of course, we're going to be weighing that against um, potentially other populations that may also be needy of transit discounts. And of course, um, the potential to instead spend those kind of funds on uh, improving transit service, making transit come quicker um, or run later at night, earlier in the morning, um, and depending on the priorities that, that we have identify uh, in the community. Thank you. Um, we want to move along, but I have a bunch of comments I want to make since this is an item that's pretty dear to my heart. Um, thank you, Zach, for making such a great uh, presentation and uh, finding this great data. I, I think uh, Santa should be commended for not only implementing this program, but also um, finding out what the benefits are uh, and the co-benefits of, for example, improving school attendance. That's tremendous. Uh, you know, maybe the, the schools, uh, education, educators can also help us uh, promote this and find funding for it, as well as supporting legislation that, to my knowledge, has been presented at state legislature, but unfortunately, it's been vetoed a few times by the governor. Um, I also want to advocate for the 24 and under uh, um, uh, work, if we can include uh, the, the, the older folks as well, because in my research, that's the age class that most needs uh, assistance with regards to uh, not only financial, but also developing this habit of using transit over uh, driving. And that age class also needs to have savings. And and I, I know from my own experience that uh, had I not bought a car, I'd be much better off financially now if I had put that money in, in some savings uh, when I was uh, of that age. Um, and I probably would have been uh, safer as well. So I hope well, we continue to work on that. And lastly, you know, this is a great report, and I want to, I, I should have done this before, but take note that uh, Sharon Cooney, uh, who is advisory here, but head of NTS, is also now the state chair of the State Transportation Committee Association. So congratulations on that. And I'll use that to say, I hope you can share this report with all the other uh, transportation providers, uh, transit providers in the state, uh, so help we can uh, promote this even further and, uh, and show the others in the state that not only are we doing it, but we have good data to show how well it works. So, but congratulations first. Any other comments? If not, this was informational, we can go on to item number six. Uh, on our last uh, meeting, Councilmember Moreno asked, uh, that we hear about the border study on the zero emissions rate uh, tr uh, transition. So Andrea is here to present the uh, findings on that study. 
Thank you. Good morning, Transportation Committee. My name is Andrea Hoff. I'll be talking about a white paper that we developed with some of our partner agencies looking at the transition to zero emission freight along the border. Um, the particular document which was included in your agenda, the actual white paper was included, was developed um, along with Caltrans District 11 and the Imperial County Transportation Commission. It explores the benefits and challenges of the freight transition to zero emissions at the border. Um, as you are aware, California has um, enacted some very ambitious zero emission regulations. In particular, 100% of our trucks, medium duty and heavy duty trucks will need to transition to zero emission by 2045. Uh, for what they call drayage trucks and high priority fleets, there's gonna need to be a transition by 2035 and there's even some actions required um, by as soon as next year. So with this context, along with some other high level dialogue between our presidents and with Baja California, Baja California Sur, we interviewed freight stakeholders, did some economic analysis and some review of literature to compile this information. Uh, the initial part of the paper really draws attention to the importance of uh, goods movement across our border uh, through our regional ports of entry. The California Baja California border region really forms the core of California's freight economy. It connects some of the largest supply chains in the nation. Um, trade crossing the border in California contributes to billions of dollars to the state and national economies annually. And in the upper right hand corner of this slide, you'll see sort of a triangle. We refer to that as a freight triangle that connects the um, northern Baja California region with the Inland Empire and the ports of LA and Long Beach. And this freight triangle contains a network that that accounts for some of the most significant trade in the state of California. Since the passage of NAFTA in the early 90s, our integration of our economies with Mexico and trade with Mexico has um, exponentially increased. It's actually increased by over 850% since the passage of NAFTA. Um, and Mexico has remained one of our top trading partners um, uh, not only for the nation, but purchases more than 15% of all of our state's exports. So our regional land ports of entry are really key to this freight network. Uh, this slide illustrates some of the benefits that we see in the state of California and in the nation as a whole. Over 1.4 million trucks moved through the region's three commercial land ports of entry in 2021 with an assumed equal number of southbound trips. So we're looking at 3 million trucks moving back and forth annually. You'll see that this um, the freight, the goods that move across the border contribute to nearly um, 23 billion in economic output for the state and even more um, near 50 billion in economic output for the region, I mean, for the nation. So the nation is actually seeing 60% of the benefit while our state of California is seeing 40% of the economic value of goods. This slide also shows the impact on jobs. We're looking at an equivalent to um, nearly 265,000 jobs nationwide. And what this slide doesn't show is the value in terms of jobs for Mexico, which is closer to 3 million. This slide continues to illustrate the importance of our regional ports of entry and the goods that cross through our border. The map on the left shows the top 10 states in terms of economic output that benefit from the goods that cross through our regional ports of entry. Every state benefits, these are the top 10 with Massachusetts as number one, Texas as number two. 
And another really important characteristic of the freight movement in our region is that most of it moves by truck. And we can see that in the graph on the right, you'll see the value through our regional gateways, our freight gateways, including by air, by our maritime port and by truck. And you can see that San Diego and Imperial County land ports of entry um, have nearly double the freight value moving through them compared to the other also very important gateways. Um, it's all a network that works together, but given that the Maquiladoras and Tijuana are not connected by rail, it becomes very important to understand that most of our very important freight moves by truck. So uh, after we we formed a, a project development team and a technical working group, um, working very closely with Caltrans um, and ICTC, but this effort was really a Caltrans and Sandag um, joint uh, effort. And interviews with freight stakeholders revealed that these California air regulations were really causing folks to rethink their entire supply chains. There was a lot of unknowns that were mentioned, including what type of safety features would these zero emission trucks have? How far would the range be? What would the cost of the truck be over its life cycle? Um, companies faced unknowns in terms of the uh, weight, how these how these trucks would be would handle, and just really citing the overall cost of transportation as being a, a main concern. The paper also points to some of the benefits and, and the urgent need for the transition to zero emission freight and zero emission vehicles. The San Diego International Border Community has been designated by uh, through AB, uh, Assembly Bill 617 and the California Air Resources Board as being particularly impacted, heavily burdened by pollution. The map you're looking at here is from Cal Enviro screen, which looks at a number of factors to identify um, environmental justice concerns among communities across the region. And you can see illustrated by the colors um, and noted on the slide that the international border community has the highest traffic percentile in, um, in the state. In, and the highest impact in terms of particulate matter 2.5, which is emitted from diesel fuel, and ends up in the 95th percentile compared to other um, areas in the entire state of California. Socioeconomic indicators from San Ysidro also illustrate that that community suffers other um, barriers to having a healthy and enhanced quality of life, including the 86th percentile in terms of poverty, high percentiles for unemployment, um, education, and linguistic isolation. And those indicators just compound exposure to contaminants and pollution. So our research really identified, ended up identifying, we categorized the findings into four areas of policy challenges associated with this transition to zero emission freight. The first is the inconsistency in air quality regulations across the border. So those in California versus those in Mexico, those in California versus those in Arizona, for example. Um, and then inconsistency within the regulations uh, regarding fleet size, I mean, where we're talking to industry stakeholders, to carriers and truckers, and some concern about being some groups being more regulated than others. Um, there's also range, weight, and cost limitations of particularly of the battery electric trucks. The um, range, uh, how far they're they're able to go compared to their diesel counterparts um, was of concern, and the, the batteries are also much heavier, so that was of concern. 
And then of course, charging and fueling infrastructure and parking for these, these new types of vehicles uh, was mentioned quite a bit. And then finally, messaging and outreach. Um, there's, there's always an opportunity to improve messaging. Um, on the right, you'll see a picture of the no dumping, only rain in the storm drain, because some of our interviewees actually brought up that campaign as being very effective as using pictures to illustrate the problem to folks. And we're suggesting that, I mean, zero emission truck regulations can be complicated just by their nature but um, using pictures or more simplified language to help folks understand um, the benefits, particularly of the transition. And then finally, we, we did an economic analysis, which illustrated that the proposed regulations could impose significant costs for truck operators, particularly those that would fall into the high priority fleet category, uh, per, particularly compared to um, smaller unregulated fleets and how that would pan out. And then indeed the increase in cost would lead to some decline in marginal economic activity with rising prices from the producer to the consumer. <clears throat> Finally, the the stakeholders, um, the technical working group, the project development team, um, and all of the research identified it a number of opportunities, which continue to grow and morph as, as this issue becomes um, more and more researched. But some of the opportunities that we identify in the paper are building infrastructure near, at, and south of the border. Um, streamlining permitting for the building of such infrastructure. You'll see on the right-hand side of the slide in the lower corner, an image of the future Otay Mesa East port of entry that's intended to provide some zero emission vehicle infrastructure. So that's a really good example, along with the new truck charging station in Otay Mesa, you'll see at the top of the screen. So those are some examples of that infrastructure, charging infrastructure needed to support the transition. We also identified the need for pilot projects, um, projects like I, I, I did watch the last meeting where you discussed this item and, and Gustavo Dayarda mentioned the Harbor 2.0 project, which is another initiative we're working on. Um, that along with Otay Mesa East could be a great location for to test some of the technology, um, <coughs> figure out um, the best ways to implement it. There was some attention to hydrogen technology as being um, more comparable to diesel as opposed to the battery electric. So many of the stakeholders brought that up. Um, overweight corridors was another issue. We're taking into consideration the additional weight that battery uh, electric trucks have. Um, and there's a number of incentives that multiple departments at Sandeg as well as Caltrans and Sandeg led studies that were continuing to explore to bring some of these opportunities to fruition, um, which I can provide more information on as, as needed. But that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Do we have any public comments, Francesca? Yes, thank you. Uh, Blair Beekman will be first, and then we'll go to Zoom and start with Tim Bylash. <clears throat> Hi, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for this item. In working with Mexico, it's always just really interesting to hear. I I love moving down here for these sort of items. Thank you. Um, and very much of a thank you that you've tried to uh, consider, you offered at the end, you wanna be considering uh, hydrogen issues, uh, to be exploring hydrogen issues. That, uh, awesome, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I don't really know what's happening, but there seems to be a real shift in, in government wanting to talk about hydrogen and to be reconsidering uh, our, our electric car, our electric battery use. Uh, as important, as vital as it is, uh, I'm totally for, for uh, an electric future that we have to be considering uh, 
what what uh, rare earth minerals and batteries can be doing. And um, good luck in those efforts. Good luck how we can make clear uh, that the uh, combustible ways that uh, current electric batteries, uh, how we can describe that to the public. How, how can they help put out those sort of fires? We need to learn how to talk about that more fully as a whole community process. Good luck. And a good luck how we can talk about uh, electric use overall uh, and its use of rare earth minerals. In terms of uh, those, those rare earth minerals have to be mined. And there's a lot of worker rights uh, that have to be respected in the, in the mining of our future of rare earth minerals. That um, if we do it well, and that's always on our minds as we build an electric future. That's building uh, peace, uh, human rights, worker rights, and I think can really address the future uh, to limit warfare between nations and just build better practices overall. So good luck in how human rights can always be a part of the future thinking, uh, worker rights of, uh, of, of rare earth mining and electric use. Thanks. I think our next speaker will be Tim Bylash, who will be followed by the original draw, who will be our last speaker on this item. Good morning, Transportation Committee. Thanks for taking my comment. I'm Timothy Bylash. I am a candidate for U.S. Congress, but I'm speaking as a resident of the city of San Diego this morning. And I really appreciate the presentations that have been given. Um, it's very much appreciated to be give, place public comment in the context of meeting discussion rather than something that's disembodied. And, and this, this can be quite awkward trying to uh, fit it within the context. So thanks for taking it. Santa does a great job compared to others. And thanks, Blair. Appreciate your comments always. I wanna add my voice to the frequency and coverage issue for the mass transportation plans. I travel from North County to the city. I go over to the airport and it's almost like cell phone reception. You're never quite sure where you're going to be able to land or pick up. Um, the poor workers, the lower income workers in the region using mass transportation, not only get paid inadequately, but they bear the biggest time tax in the region. And uh, so being able to have reliable service at the issues of frequency and time to transit that the Sandag continually works on, I just urge not to give up on that. And I think that will, as this uh, um, a discussion uh, shows, will be useful. Congratulations to Sandag and the organizations that pushed uh, through the plan that put in all these uh, features last October after 10 years of it being in limbo. It, it didn't just happen by itself. I might consider a buy one, ride one free program for the 18 to 30 age group as an intermediate incentive to improve ridership that helps in all the ways that have been pointed out during this discussion. Thank you, congratulations to everybody for this and appreciate the ability to comment. I think your next speaker will be the original draw and then we have one more hand go up. Christina Marquez will uh, follow and be our final speaker. When you hear you guys talking about this, I mean, you're setting yourself up for some severe trouble as far as, you know, goods being transported across the border. Um, because if you, you know, these trucks can only weigh 80,000 pounds. And if a battery is going to add 15,000 pounds to that, the amount of freight that they can actually transport um, decreases significantly. Um, and then, you know, if they have to do 10 hour resets, um, you know, you're going to be spending a lot of, they're going to be spending a lot of time having to charge these trucks. Um, and it's not cost effective. All this cost is going to come down onto the consumer because you have owner operators who are not even going to be able to, uh, afford a truck like this. And the fact that these trucks weigh so much, um, you know, is going to be doing damage to the roads that, um, you know, we're not even keeping in good condition. And when you want to charge these, um, lithium bombs that could also potentially, because there are head-on collisions with semis um, more often than you would think, and that would lead to a severe fire that would not be able to be put out, especially in such a big car uh, truck, because even just a Tesla, uh, which they recalled 2 million of those for the self-driving feature, um, but they 
it, it takes so much, like they'll just keep combusting and it takes so much tens of thousands of gallons of water that you won't even be able to put out one of these trucks if it, if it gets on fire and even charging it, a house um, is about 1.2 kilowatts per hour. Um, and just one of the Tesla charging stations is about, if you want to do it on a supercharge, is about 350 kilowatts per hour. And if you have like six of those, that's like neighborhoods full of power that is being um, used just to um, charge these. So I don't know how, even if you put the infrastructure in, how the power grid is even going to be able to handle anything like that when we already are telling people that they can't charge their car or use AC during the summer because of the the stretch that it's putting on the power grid so everything in this is set up to fail and it's going to make that we're not going to get any goods i think our final speaker will be christina marquez you can go ahead good morning again christina marquez with ibw local 569 the electrical workers union representing 3600 members in san diego and imperial counties um we're excited about these projects. We know that we're at a pivotal moment right now, especially for Sandag and the county in making sure that we plan this correctly and it is installed correctly and that it uplifts those that are installing these systems. So ensuring that um, we have electricians certified by the state of California installing the infrastructure and the electric vehicle supply equipment or EVSE, um, ensuring that they have the certifications of EVITP or electric vehicle infrastructure training program. And all this uh, is, is um, already integrated in all the apprenticeship program programs that we have um, that are joint labor management, state approved apprenticeships, um, and all of our journeymen have that. We have over 800 that have those certifications. We're ready to do this work. We're ready to do it correctly. And um, we're excited about that, including hydrogen. Um, we know that there, there's gonna be a combination of um, electric vehicles and hydrogen. So it's not just gonna be one, one area. Um, and yeah, thank you. Looking forward to working with you on, on planning these and making sure that we get it done right. Thank you. I yield my time. Thank you. That concludes the public commenters. Councilmember Moreno. Um, thank you for the presentation and uh, thank you for this very fascinating report. Um, as many of you are learning, I love to have my Otay Mesa moments um, because it's such an important part of our regional economy. Um, I do want to make one clarification, though. If you can go back to slide number six, um, if you don't mind going back to slide number six for these comments, because I want I would like the committee to. There we go. Um, what is referenced here is San Isidro um, and San Isidro, you guys, is um, right where it says Tijuana up north. Um, if, if, you, if you have a little cursor, if you could, I don't know if you guys can take a look at that. Um, San Isidro is um, in the middle and it has a very high um, Calenviro screen um, percentile. Um, it is the most cross-border of the world. Um, and there hasn't been a semi-truck that has crossed that border since the 80s or 90s. If a semi-truck is at that border, it, is, it went the wrong way, and it's going to have a hell of a time coming back. The topic today, for and there all the issues that were brought up about San Isidro, obviously I don't dismiss, but the topic today is the Otay Mesa border crossing proper, as I like to call it, which is over where it says 11. That's the area that we're talking about and that my comments are going to be um, focused on. Um, obviously, the Calenviro screen is also, um, you know, it's not quite orange like it is in San Isidro that has, what is it, 70,000 vehicles crossing northbound every single day and all that pollution to add to that. It's a valley, all that, that basin just breathes in um, that uh, that stuff. And I, we won't get into the Tijuana River Valley smell. Uh, that's for another topic. But um, I thought that the results um, uh, that um, the, the results were sobering to say the least. Um, 
after reading this report, I simply don't understand how carb zero emission freight regulations are going to be feasible with our very important uh, cross-border um, economy. Um, has CARB specifically considered the unique factors surrounding the cross-border trucking economy identified in your report? And for instance, has CARB considered uh, that the time necessary to recharge zero emission trucks is incompatible with the Customs Trade Partnership Against Terror Terrorism, also called CTPAP program? Um, ha have, have they taken that, have you guys taken that into consideration? Yes. Um, so, oh, and you know, I'm sorry. I no, should please. I should let folks know that uh, the CTPAP is like a sentry or sentry for truckers. And believe you me, everybody wants this. Everybody's vying to get it. You cross quicker. Yes, thank you for the, the questions. Yes, you cross quicker with CTPAP. It also requires that you secure your entire supply chain from the every warehouse, every trip. Um, so these regulations are could potentially be very problematic for um, the cross-border fleets. We have um, presented this research at the California Transportation Commission. It received quite a bit of attention. We, um, as a result, we have um, stakeholders in Otay Mesa like Alejandro Mieri Terán at Otay Mesa Chamber of Commerce and what CARB has, I think CARB has, the folks that I've met with have um, realized that there's unanswered questions and that there's a need for more communication. So not that the regulations have changed, but the attention on the cross-border sector has changed and we have regular check-ins with them to talk about you get a better understanding of the regulations. How are they really going to impact dual plated trucks? How would they be regulating um, those large um, owner operators in, in Tijuana? So there's quite a bit of complexities and I've seen the willingness. Um, I sit in with the Otay Mesa Chamber of Commerce. We kind of have these regular check-ins so that we can continue to you know, is there a need for another workshop? Is there a need for more outreach to the maquiladores in Mexico? So there's progress. Um, I think there was attempts to ch change the regulations. I haven't seen them change necessarily, um, but there's been attempts to. So I think that folks, the attention is growing on it and we're working together to continue to kind of figure out the best way to go about this. Um, and that, that would be my Thank response you for that. to that. But, yeah. um, you didn't answer my question. I, my question was, has CARB considered? Has CARB considered? You, you're mentioning the trucking industry, but has CARB considered how these changes are going to impact the very important cross-border economy? I think that their willingness to continue to work with the stakeholders down in our region shows that they've considered it. Um, I, this paper did um, feed into an analysis, sort of a, a larger analysis at the state level um, of clean freight corridors, um, CARB's connection to, you know, the, the various state agencies. I'm hoping that there's some diffusion of information happening among them. Um, but as of now, the regulations have not changed. There's just been additional clarifications made and attempts to kind of help the stakeholders, help the truckers, help the chambers of commerce meet these regulations. So how do you, as a member of the technical working group, how do you think these inconsistencies between CARB's program and the trucking economy, how do you think this is going to be resolved? Well, with a, with a continued work and continued knowledge. So there's a few um, ways that we've been as an agency, and I, and I know Caltrans has participated as well. We visited, I know USDOT held a zero or electrification seminar in Mexico City, and we were, the Otay Mesa East team was able to go there and present this paper. We learned a lot about some of the incentives and good, great work that Mexico uh, the city of Mexico has been able to instill in terms of incentives. They actually have the largest fleet of electric buses in all of Latin America. 
So some great progress being made. Um, we just continue to, to tell the story and, and bring folks together. Um, the charging, the ability of the infrastructure to, or the grid to handle large charging um, outputs, I know that the California Energy Commission and the CPUC have initiated some conversations and have invited SANDAG to participate in those. So it's sort of diverse efforts, but work like this and being able to really talk to the folks down there and get this these important issues on paper has, I think, moved the issues forward. Yeah. yeah. I just, I think I'm a little bit more concerned, um, to be honest, with all due respect, hearing mm -hmm. your response. Mexico City is really far away from um, the, the Tijuana-San Diego yeah. border region. Um, I am really concerned um, with the lack of infrastructure that exists in the United States here. I think it was like a 90 page document illustrates that there aren't any charging facility. There aren't that many charging facility at the border for trucks, for semi trucks, um, the ability for the trucks, how far they go. The weight of the truck is a huge factor in the trucking industry. Um, and let's not get started with Mexico. Right, Tijuana. This is just virtually non-existent um, anywhere. Uh, and what I mean is non-existence is places where these trucks can be um, um, fueled. I don't know what you call it, electrified, charged. Thank you. Um, but I do thank you for the report, and I do thank you for answering the questions. Um, I think. Um, I'd love to join the technical working group and, and give a really honest, um, I don't want to join your working group. I'm being facetious, uh, but I think we need to give them um, a sobering, um, sobering details about how the cross-border economy works. Um, it's been my understanding, even just in the trucking industry, um, the Otay Mesa, cross-border economy is just an, an anomaly. We we work in a silo, essentially, right? Um, I say we. We work in a silo. Um, and I from Mexico City and from um, Washington, D.C., and from apparently Sacramento. Um, so I am very, very concerned that ultimately if these new rules kill the cross-border trucking industry in California, no one's going to benefit. Um, we absolutely saw the benefits of this cross-border economy uh, during COVID, right? Because that, I mean, the economy, the, the trucking industry went up by 20%. We were moving, getting things in and out throughout the whole, as your um, uh, project, as your slide indicates, throughout the whole nation. Um, ultimately, there's going to be more diesel uh, pollution in Mexico as company, uh, company trucks, goods to border crossings to places like Arizona. Um, and less economic activity in the California border region, which is exactly what we don't want for Otay Mesa. Otay Mesa is just at its peak right now. It's just entering its its um, its very beautiful future, I think. Um, and these are jobs that um, I met with uh, Senator Jones, and he was mentioning Poway. Poway has a huge trucking industry, and that's another area that absolutely in the San Diego region, if I could, um, in, you know, bring my comrades from the north um, eastern part of San Diego region um, to this effort. I think this is going to be really bad before it gets good. And I'm extremely concerned, I will say that. Uh, but with that, that concludes my comments, Chair, and thank you for all the time. Thank you, guys. Any other comments or questions from board members? Sure. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I just had a quick question. Could we put the slide back up that has the Enviro screen uh, geographic colors on it? Not this slide. Thank you. So I want to make sure I'm understanding this. I see the um, description on the left, and then I see the map on the right. This is Cal Enviro screen 4.0. Do those who does the rest of the description relate to the to the map or what exactly is in the color on the map what, what is that what's is there what's a legend or the description for it or, or is it what all those different things like unemployment and education etc on the left 
Really good questions. No, actually, the the map relates to the um, first two bullets. Cal and ViroScreen, what it does is it takes various indicators, uh, exposure to pollution, a whole host of other factors, and it assigns a score. So the score that these red areas and orange areas, the score is much higher for them in terms of burden. It's sort of a, it's an index. Yeah, I guess burden. I don't understand. I have any and, idea what the other factors are other than the pollution that are in the index. So it's just hard for me to to make much out of what it is without knowing what, what the basis for it is. Understood. Um, I don't have the other indicators uh, right off hand, but I, I will suggest, as you're correctly pointed out, that the third bullet dealing with socioeconomic indicators is not necessarily, they're probably reflected in the Cal and Viro screen uh, index, but that's not why they're placed there. They're placed there as additional sort of confounding variables. So we have the Cal and Viro screen score and then these socioeconomic variables that kind of, I mean, they work, they work together because folks that are facing additional burdens can't, uh, they're not, as, it's, the community's not as resilient to pollution burdens. Oh, I fully understand the concept of what's written on the left. I just um, don't understand the concept of there really in reality is only air pollution. And when it's measured, it's the same, regardless of whether it's, you know, at a mansion on the beach or whether it's a something inland. Now, if we add the socioeconomic factors to it, that adds another layer of understanding of the effects. But when I look at this, the reason I asked the question is I can't imagine that this is actually the Enviro screen just has pure pollution um, as the measurement because mm -hmm. frequently the air in Coronado is the same as the air in Barrio Logan. And some days it's actually worse. So for some reason, you know, I can't see any of that information from this. So if we get another presentation on it, maybe we could get the, some more information that would help me have a better understanding. And obviously I'll look it up myself, but um, I was just curious why the, the white areas are white and the other areas are not, if it's pollution or if it's a combination of something I don't understand. Point taken, yes. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Councilman Duncan. And of course, you and I have talked about this issue before. There are other Cal environmental screening maps, uh, particularly for diesel particulate matter, and that would show uh, something but more dramatic in terms of how the border communities, as well as um, uh, uh, National City and, and Logan, uh, Logan Heights and, and um, City of Coronado as, uh, in the 98th percentile with regards to diesel particular matter. There's also maps on 2.5, uh, which is off the charts with regards to the communities that uh, Councilman Moreno uh, represents. Um, and that's, that's really important. And, and unfortunately, we don't really, I don't, I don't think we do a lot of measurements of 2.5. So, so um, I think uh, those maps may be helpful because they particularly uh, address um, uh, the, the vehicles, the trucks that we're talking about. Any other council member uh, comments or um, questions? If not, I have a short list, but I'll try to go quickly. Um, and so I'll just make some comments uh, so we don't have to go back and forth with uh, questions. My, my general comment is that I hear about costs of transitioning all the time. I just hope that we don't see costs as something that is pro prohibiting us from making the conversion. Because one of the costs that we don't consider is the cost of healthcare, the cost of parents having to take their child to the hospital because of asthma attack. Uh, so when I hear costs, I don't think we're looking at the entire picture. We're not looking at the externalities with regards to the harm uh, uh, these particular matter is causing in our communities. When you figure in those costs, um, we really need to address this quickly <laughs> and, and, and with urgency. Uh, so that would be my answer to to people who are worried about the uh, cost of conversion. Um, and with regards to charging stations and and, and power grids, um, the San Diego Community Power is looking at microgrids and charging uh, in the infill areas. So when I look at the properties around Otay Mesa, for example, I don't see very many uh, solar panels. And so I see the potential for for using that property for, for generating power there and producing a, a microgrid so we're not dependent on, on some of the other infrastructure that uh, SDAG&E uh, wants to, to build. So I think uh, having partnerships in other with other groups may be helpful 
uh, to develop that. Along with that is working with Caltrans, since they have a lot of property next to uh, fr freeways and highways to develop uh, charging stations uh, in that system. Uh, and, and so we have maybe some public property that may be useful in, in producing the charging stations. Technology is changing, uh, and soon we hope to have, I hope we have, uh, batteries that weigh one third less than the current batteries that we're using, as well as in uh, charging times that are far reduced uh, than the current long term. So, uh, I, I, and that's coming in the next few years. So I, I really think that some of these hurdles that we have are gonna be reduced uh, going forward. And lastly, you know, there are other efforts being done in our uh, uh, region. Um, the port side community, along with uh, APCD, is implementing an MCAS with very uh, strong ambitions of reducing or making a conversion uh, uh, with an interim target of 40% uh, change to all electric uh, trucks and, and light and heavy duty uh, trucks uh, by 2026. So in the next uh, few years, uh, we hope to have some conversions. Um, and then with a 80% conversion by 2030. That's the kind of targets that we need to set for our community and regions. And interesting enough, uh, there is actually uh, uh, some, um, some realistic uh, um, data that we have that we can achieve these targets within those um, timelines. Uh, for and I'll give you a quick example. The, the port I just heard from the port commission when they're looking at the trucks that are going in and out of uh, the port, port district areas. This is primarily around uh, National City and San Ysidro, um, or I'm sorry, uh, Logan Heights. Um, that even though they have 2,000 trucks going in and out, 40% uh, of the the trips are done by 200 trucks. So in other words, if we convert 10% of, uh, of, of the vehicles to be EV, we would have effect on 40% of the emissions. That's the kind of data we need to work with and, and look into and then figure out um, with regards to border crossings, where can we have the most impact uh, with, with making this conversion and then coming up with uh, uh, methods of making that. And lastly, my last comment is, I hope we also look at um, cost systems uh, in terms of um, cost systems that are uh, mindful of, of mean-based as well as uh, equity so that we could implement programs that can make a difference quickly, uh, strategically, uh, but also addressing those issues uh, so that we don't have the poor pay more uh, or not be, um, uh, can't take advantage of of the, of the economy across the border. So I think those are things that we can do. It's more complex, uh, but I think uh, that's where SANDAC can shine, that we have that ability to look into this data, gather the data, and come up with solutions and implement them uh, for cross, uh, cross border issues. That's what we did with Otay Mesa Crossing uh, East. So we just need to make those mechanisms available. And I really appreciate um, uh, Andrew, your work as well as Sandag's work and attention to this area that, that affects our community so greatly. This was the information item. Any other comments? If, if not, we can go to my uh, my, my last assignment. Uh, 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 just, just a quick comment. Uh, we are looking at a feasibility study of where can we locate charging stations, um, both for San Diego and Imperial County. On and off state right away. So we are looking at state right away uh, parcels that we own that are uh, a good opportunity for this. I think uh, we're looking at middle of next year uh, to complete that feasibility study. Uh, now there are some rules um, about placing charging stations on on state right away, uh, and the rules are more stringent if it's on operating right away, and if it's on an interstate. Um, but uh, but there are some there's some state law and some federal law that um, that uh, potentially prevents the location of these things um, in certain in certain places, and, and um, that is something that um, that on a statewide basis is being looked at. Thank you, Gustavo. Any other comments or questions, Gustavo? That sounds like a great project for a retired Newton to work on. <laughs> Any other comments? If not, 
I'm going to go around, uh, go back to public. Uh, you didn't do your homework. I'll call you on last. I'm going to go clockwise then. <laughs> so, Supervisor, uh, we'll start with Supervisor Anderson. Do you have a comment about what, how we did last in the last year and what would you like to see next year? Uh, two sentences. Council Mendoza, you have lots of experience with San Ag and on this committee. Please <laughs> help us. Um, I, I was paying so much attention to everything that was being said at the meeting that I, I, I um, but um, like I, I said at the beginning, I, I really have appreciated over the past eight years um, uh, uh, being on this committee. I know that's more than one sentence, but um, because um, it, it, it does help us as uh, um, local uh, government um, to to see how we connect to the entire uh, in, entire region, and that's why I think this committee is a very important one for um, on Sand Day. Thank you, Jennifer Casmanzito. Trying to remember your questions, but the first one was what, what went well. I think, and I just I would just say that. I'm always very uh, pleasantly surprised, not pleasantly surprised, but pleasantly happy with uh, how well staff does in presenting the information and bringing us useful and and very helpful information and uh, and almost always having the right people here to answer the questions. So that, that I think is something that's going really well. As far as next year, I have some concerns since we'll have half as many time slots that we're going to be able to do meeting, meeting management well and uh, keeping ourselves on track and um, and being able to actually make sure we have the right amount, necessary amount of time to do the deliberation and discussion that we should be doing since we're going to be cutting our meeting times, meeting me, available meeting slots in half. Um, and uh, more importantly, because I do think, for example, the, the committee could be used a little bit more heavily with respect to discussions around the regional plan um, that's that's upcoming. And notice, for example, that the, the next discussion of the regional plan is going to the board first before coming here, and it seems like it, it should be flipped. There you go. Thank you, Raphael. Uh, I'd say what went well is the presence of the theme of transit equity throughout the year. And next year, what could be done better is a deeper dive on equity and the impacts to burdened communities. Hey, Gustavo, you have any reflection on this last year and where we should go next year? Yeah, I have some parting thoughts. Um, to me, what, what goes well is that everybody comes to the table uh, to present the, a unique perspective of the transportation needs of the region because they're not the same. And I think hearing from everybody before decisions are made works really well. Um, for next year, the only thing that I that I could say is in my past life as a corridor director, I used to come to this meeting a lot more often uh, when I had the I-15 Express Lanes project to give regular updates uh, about the status of the project. And I think that um, I, haven't, I, I haven't seen as much of that uh, in recent years. I think that um, to the extent that a lot of the projects that we work on, that both Sandag and Caltrans work on jointly, take many years to complete. I, uh, we are available uh, to give you regular updates on, on some of the major projects if there is an interest and not just come here when decisions need to be made or when decisions are being made. Uh, so I just offer that from the team and, and I'm just volunteer my successor uh, to bring more presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Gustavo. Gus Manson. Um, yes. Okay. So, uh, Supervisor Anderson, can I have your time? <laughs> yeah. You say you okay. got four sentences. Good, yes. good. Okay. So, it's either that or no punctuation and really long sentences. So, um, with my NCTD hat on, I would say that uh, what I liked that happened this year is uh, key budget amendments that uh, the that TC has recommended uh, that programmed large amounts of funding for Batiquitos and the San Diego phase two. T and with no punctuation here, TC's fo focus on zero emission blueprint and NCTD's transition of uh, bus and rail fleet and focus on changing community commuting patterns, sorry, that, that also target hybrid commuters and leisure riders because we do need to get everyone on board. Um, and then things that I hope for in 2024 that TC will, might 
prioritize um, would be expanded funding for transit operations so operators can increase service frequencies. As an example, it's 1130. I've now missed my coaster northbound. There's not another one for another two hours, nor is there a Pacific Surfliner. So I either leave meetings early or I have to wait for two hours <laughs> and I'm not the only person. So if, if we want everyone to ride, we need frequency. Um, expand discussion on bus reliability improvements, including NCTD's breed, Breeze Speed and reliability study. I think it's really important. And continuation of the Sorrento Valley Coaster Connection Service. Um, this is a crucial connection to one of our region's major employment centers. And I think it's vitally important. Th that's my really long two sentences. Thanks. Thank you, Casa Moreno. Um, I really enjoyed meeting in person. Um, and I look forward to reviewing the transit first study when it's complete. Great. Thank you. Councilman Duncan. Thank you. A couple thoughts is um, I've enjoyed being on this committee and I think I've learned quite a bit over the last year. I appreciate everybody on the committee um, has a desire to try to make a little bit of a, a difference for our, our region. And um, I wanted to thank you, Chair. I think sometimes on certain issues, you and I are far apart and on other ones we completely agree, but you always have a calm professional demeanor, almost always once in a while, but with me though, you always have one. And so um, I thank you for that. Uh, final comment is that while I agree with board member Zito's comments about our staff and add that I think the staff here is extremely competent um, and bright and well-intended, I have noticed, I think over the last year, um, a little more openness to I think work mm -hmm. with all the board members or, and specifically our committee members and I appreciate that. So I encourage that with um, all the leadership of, of SANDAG to try to continue that. I think it it makes a big difference um, to try to ensure we're all educated. And if we have a concern to keep an open mind that it's not necessarily just, you know, a new person with the strain, you know, all the concerns I think are well-intended and I appreciate the engagement, so thank you. Thank you, before I make my two sentences, I wanna make sure that staff, if you have any comments, uh, Betsy, Brian and Colleen, you you can weigh in on this if you like. No, okay. So here are my two uh, um, Chair, just real quick, Betsy uh, Blake, our legal counsel did say she really enjoys working with me and right. all of my- She, 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 was, she was trying to be <laughs> good. Um, so uh, I, I think what I really liked about this last year is attention to good data uh, to help us um, uh, solve our transportation challenges in our region. Uh, I think uh, Sandang has done a pretty good, great job of doing that as we heard uh, today. Uh, so that was great. Uh, for next year, I hope we can really deal with the health impacts, reducing health impacts in the next regional plan um, and, and paying attention to that through this committee and providing that input uh, to the entire board. Um, and that, yeah, so many of you know that's been the passion of mine this last year, and I hope we can pursue that uh, uh, next year through this committee uh, and, and provide that kind of um, guidance on the next regional plan. Um, uh, so that's my target for next year. And lastly, um, since I serve in the air pollution control district, district I get freebies from them. So I provided some some calendars for next year for those who, who like them. So I have a few of those to, to pass out. <clears throat> Please join them. Uh, someone commented how nice they are because they're children's art. And since I'm a grandparent now, I, I, I started appreciating that stuff again. So with that, <clears throat> that concludes our meeting. And our next meeting will be January 19th at nine um, next year. So happy new year and happy holidays. Thank you.